In this video, I'm going to cover the properties of liquids. So, um, when something dissolves, when a compound dissolves, that's when it mixes with another compound and the two particles um, can get mixed up together. So generally, in this course, when we talk about something dissolving, and particularly in this chapter, we're going to be thinking about compounds dissolving in a liquid. So when compounds dissolve in a liquid, whether or not they dissolve, like when you put salt in water, it seems to disappear, it dissolves. But when you put sand in water, it does not disappear, it just sinks to the bottom of the cup. So um, whether or not something is going to dissolve depends on the attractive forces of the solute and solvent molecules. So a good rule for determining whether one compound is going to dissolve in a liquid of another compound is to employ the rule like dissolves like. So what this means is that um, polar compounds like to dissolve polar compounds and nonpolar compounds like to dissolve nonpolar compounds. So like dissolves like. But it means that polar and nonpolar do not mix. So polar so polar compounds like to mix together and nonpolar compounds like to mix together but but nonpolar and polar do not mix. So um, remember polar groups are those that have uh, electronegative atoms. So the most electronegative atoms on the periodic table are uh, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, the halogens. So generally if those atoms are in a molecule then those um, then that molecule has polar groups. So polar groups like to mix together, like to, they'll dissolve in each other. Um, and groups that are nonpolar are generally um, C and H groups, or C and C groups. So two atoms that are the same, uh, the same type of atom, or two atoms that are really similar in electronegativity will be nonpolar groups. So these aren't exclusive, it's not just CH and CC. It's any time the difference in electronegativity is 0.4 or less. So, uh, here's an example of when two liquids don't mix together. So when I put water and pentane together, they kind of form a system that looks like this, where it looks like I have one liquid sitting on top of another, and that's precisely what's happening. The water molecules are more dense, so they'll sink to the bottom, they'll be in the bottom phase. And the pentane molecules are less dense, so they sit on top. And the reason that they don't mix together is because water is very polar. It has an oxygen. The difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and oxygen is 1.4. So that's a big difference in electronegativity, and that makes these H2O molecules very polar. But the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is only 0.4. So that makes these groups up here very nonpolar. And polar and nonpolar don't mix, so they don't mix together. The nonpolar molecules would rather be next to each other because they're all nonpolar. And the polar molecules would rather be next to each other because they're all polar. So they kind of set themselves up like this in a system where they don't mix together, kind of like oil and vinegar. Uh, another property of liquids is called surface tension. And surface tension is a property that results from the tendency of liquids to minimize their surface area. So uh, one example of that is when water, this is a, in a picture of water in the space station. So in the space station, there's no gravity. And uh, a drop of water, a, a, any sample of water, kind of forms itself into a sphere like this. And so the molecules are kind of pulling themselves inward and so all the molecules kind of pull toward the center of the mass and that makes a sphere. And so the tendency of molecules to kind of pull inward like that and kind of create um, uh, some tension on the surface is called surface tension. So here is um, one, uh, one example of surface tension that you might have seen before. Um, a paper clip floating on water or maybe you've seen um, certain kinds of bugs that can kind of skim across the top of the water and look like they're walking on the water. So the reason for this is because the surface of the water is actually 
more dense. The particles are actually closer together at the surface than they are just underneath the surface. So it kind of forms like a skin. Um, the water forms a skin on top, that very top layer, because the, the molecules, the water H2O molecules, get pulled together very closely, and so it makes the top very dense. This is why that happens. Because a water molecule that's just under the surface is surrounded by other water molecules. And water molecules have attractive forces. They feel intermolecular forces. Uh, in water, in H2O, that intermolecular force is a hydrogen bond. So this water molecule in the middle is being pulled on by all of these water molecules around the outside by hydrogen bonds, these dotted lines here. When a water molecule is surrounded by other water molecules, it's being pulled equally in all directions. And if you're being pulled equally in all directions, you don't really move anywhere. You're kind of stuck, you kind of sit in the same place. Here, a surface molecule, though, is not completely surrounded by water molecules. It's only surrounded by water molecules on the bottom. There's no water molecules on top because these are the water molecules on the top. This is the top layer. So that means that if all of these water molecules are pulling on the one in the middle and there's nothing on top to balance that and to also pull up, then the net force of all of these pulling is to pull the water molecules on the top down. They get pulled down because there's nothing up here to offset that pull. So all the water molecules in the top layer are being pulled down more than they're being pulled up, which means that they kind of get squished together. And then they get squished together really tight like that, they form a layer on top, and we call that the surface tension. So the surface tension of a liquid is the energy required to increase the surface area to a given amount. So uh, here is one measurement, here's one way that we could measure the surface tension of water. We say that it's 72.8 millijoules per square meter. So it would take 72.8 millijoules of energy to, uh, to spread it out, to increase the surface area of some amount of water to one square meter. And the reason that it would take that amount of energy is because those particles are pulling on each other. So we're really measuring the strength of the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the surface tension. So um, particles that have H2, that have hydrogen bonds have very high surface tension because they have very strong intermolecular forces. But uh, molecules that are nonpolar, that only have dispersion, uh, they don't have very strong attractive forces. They're not pulling on each other very hard. So if they're not pulling on each other very hard, then they're not going to create that very dense skin on the top. So as the strength of the intermolecular force increases in a sample, so too does its surface tension. And um, weak intermolecular forces lead to low surface tension. So we can see an example of that here. H2O, a very polar molecule, has a very high surface tension. And uh, C6H6 benzene is a very nonpolar molecule, and it doesn't have any polar bonds. These are um, not a very small difference in electronegativity, so the surface tension is low. It takes much less energy because the particles are not pulling on each other as much. The attractive forces are weaker. Viscosity is another property of a liquid. It's the resistance of a liquid to flow. So this is the difference between when you pour uh, water or you pour some olive oil or you pour some syrup. Right? The difference in the pouring of those different kinds of liquids is a difference in viscosity. So when you, um, a liquid is flowing, that's like you're pouring that liquid. So it's really easy to pour water. It has a very low viscosity. Um, and uh, it's more difficult to pour syrup. Syrup has a high viscosity. Uh, and cold syrup has a higher viscosity than warm syrup, right? If you put the syrup in the microwave, then it can flow a lot easier. So viscosity is a function of temperature. When it's cold, the viscosity is, is higher, and when it's warmed up, the viscosity is lower. 
And viscosity is also a measure of, again, the intermolecular forces. When particles are pulling on each other, um, then that generally creates a higher viscosity. And when particles have, um, have smaller intermolecular forces, then they're able to kind of slip by each other easier. They're not pulling on each other, and so they flow much easier. They don't get stuck together. They're not sticky. So here's some examples. Um, pentane, these are all hydrocarbons, which means that they only have carbon and hydrogen in their formulas. And carbon and hydrogen is, uh, makes nonpolar bonds. So all of these are nonpolar molecules. So the only intermolecular force that they have is dispersion. And remember, the dispersion force increases for um, cigar-shaped molecules like this. The dispersion force increases as the surface area increases. So this molecule has more surface area than the previous one. This one has more than the previous one, and so on and so on. As these get longer, they have more surface area, so they have stronger dispersion forces. And so as their dispersion forces increase, so too does the viscosity it becomes harder and harder to pour these liquids or they resist flow more as their intermolecular forces increase and in this case that intermolecular force is dispersion which is increasing due to an increase in surface area the stronger the intermolecular attractive forces the higher the liquids viscosity will be the more spherical the molecular shape the lower the, the viscosity will be so um, molecules that are shaped like spheres uh, have less um, dispersion force, right? Because they have less surface area, so they experience less dispersion force. And they also, being shaped like balls, they can roll past each other more easily. The, um, the, not only does the viscosity, is, a, is it affected by the type of intermolecular force, like whether it's dipole-dipole or hydrogen bond or dispersion, but it's also um, affected by the shape of the molecule. So if a molecule is really long, like a really long stick, it almost becomes like a string. So a long molecule that's kind of string-like, you can imagine that if you try to pour a lot of molecules that are shaped like strings, they can start to get tangled up in each other, and so it wouldn't pour as easily. So more spherical molecules can pour past each other, can move past each other like spheres would, like balls, and really long molecules would get stuck on each other um, even you, you know, without uh, respect to their different intermolecular forces just because of the fact that they're shaped like strings. They can kind of get wrapped up in each other. And again, raising the temperature of a liquid reduces its viscosity, like pulling the syrup out of the fridge and it doesn't pour very quickly. But if you put it in the microwave, it's going to pour a lot faster. You're uh, reducing the viscosity. Another property of a liquid is capillary action. Capillary action is the ability of a liquid to flow up a thin tube against the influence of gravity. The narrower the tube, the higher the liquid rises. Um, capillary action is the result of two forces working in conjunction, cohesive and adhesive forces. So cohesive forces are forces that hold molecules together. So those are like the intermolecular forces that we've talked about already. We would call those cohesive forces. Adhesive forces are those that attract the liquid to uh, another molecule. For, for example, in this case, the other molecule is the surface of the tube. So cohesive forces are um, attractive forces between particles of the same kind, so like between water molecules. And adhesive is when the water gets stuck to the side. Cohesion and adhesion. So what happens to cause this capillary action where the water inside of a tube is seen to kind of rise in the tube against gravity is that the water molecules are attracted to the glass in the uh, tube. And so as a water molecule is attracted to the glass, and it gets pulled up a little bit to the, uh, to the glass, then the water molecule behind it is stuck to it through cohesive forces. So adhesive forces kind of stick the water molecules to the glass, and then because those water molecules are stuck to the glass, the cohesive forces that stick the water molecules together kind of pull a whole section of water up the tube. 
So the adhesive forces pull the surface up and the cohesive forces pull all of the other molecules with it like a chain. The liquid rises up the tube until the force of gravity counteracts the capillary action forces. So you can see here in this narrow tube, there's more adhesive forces um, per water molecule. And in this really wide tube, there's more water and there's less adhesive forces. So when the adhesive forces go down and the tube is wider, then the, uh, the liquid cannot go as high in the tube. And when it's really small, when the, um, when the tube is more narrow, then there's more adhesion and the water can travel higher up the tube. Okay, so meniscus, again, is another um, example of the competition between adhesive and cohesive forces. So H2O is a polar substance uh, because of the difference in electronegativity between H and O. So that leads to polar bonds. And so water is a polar molecule. And um, glass is made of silica dioxide. So the difference between silica and oxygen, the difference in electronegativity, is also large enough to mean that this is a polar molecule. These are polar bonds, and this is a polar molecule. So when we have water molecules, when we have a polar substance in, inside of a polar container, then that polar liquid is attracted to the sides of the container because they have similar intermolecular forces. So water um, has dipole moments, and the silica dioxide has dipole moments. So the positive end of a water molecule is attracted to the negative end of a silica dioxide molecule. So they have similar intermolecular forces and they can interact similarly. And that pulls the water molecules up the sides of the container. So you can see it kind of bends like this. It makes a, a, a lens on the surface of the water. And the reason that it bends up on the sides is because those water molecules are attracted to the glass and they're being pulled up the side of the glass. So um, in here, um, this we see another kind of uh, meniscus here in this tube. And in this tube, the reason that the meniscus kind of curves upward like this is because this is mercury in this tube, and mercury is nonpolar. In order for a substance to be polar, there has to be a difference in electronegativity between two atoms in a bond. Well, a pure substance that only has one atom in it, like mercury or any of the elements on the periodic table, are not polar. Even pure oxygen is not polar by itself because it's just O. And if it's just O, there's no difference in electronegativity, and so there's no polar bond. So a pure element like mercury is nonpolar, but the glass is still polar. So here we're seeing the interaction between a substance, substances that don't mix. Mercury particles have cohesive for forces, and the cohesive forces mer in mercury mean that the mercury particles want to stay together. There's some attraction between mercury particles. So like dissolves like, and nonpolar particles like nonpolar particles, and polar particles like polar particles, but polar and nonpolar don't mix. So when I put a nonpolar substance in a polar container, the nonpolar substance tries to avoid touching the sides of the container to any extent possible. And so all of this extra mercury that's kind of bubbled up on top here, notice that it's not touching the sides of the container. It completely avoids touching the sides of the container. So in order to prevent mercury from interacting with the sides of the container, some of the mercury that would otherwise be on the sides gets pushed up and it gets, makes a little bubble on top. And that's to prevent the, uh, so that the mercury particles do not interact with the, um, the, glass, the polar glass particles. So uh, we call this kind of meniscus convex because uh, the cohesive forces are stronger in mercury than the adhesive forces are for mercury to glass. And we call this kind of meniscus concave because the adhesion to the glass is stronger than the cohesion of water molecules. The water molecules in this case would rather stick to the glass than to each other. So they reach up the glass.